to say something about framing what has been happening to the world, to us, to the communities you represent, and what makes the Jewish response different and special? The short answer is that globalization, which for everyone else is the newest of the new, is for us the oldest of the old. Already with the destruction of the second temple, Jews had scattered to Babylon, to, to, uh, to Egypt, and to elsewhere, to Lebanon. By the destruction of the second temple, they were scattered around the Mediterranean. They were distributed across the civilized world, and yet they saw themselves and were seen by others as one nation, one people. They were the world's first global people. And it was extraordinary because they had none of the characteristics of a nation, none of them. They did not live in the same land. They did not live under the same political system. They did not speak the same language of everyday speech. Um, Rashi spoke French, Rambam spoke Arabic. They didn't inhabit the same culture. Rashi was in a Christian culture. The Rambam was in a Muslim culture. They didn't share the same fate. When uh, Jews were experiencing their golden age in Spain, 11th and 12th centuries, Jews in Northern Europe were being massacred by the Crusaders. When Jews were expelled from Spain, when Spanish Jewry reached its, its end, Jews in Poland were enjoying an unusual moment of, of tolerance. So they didn't share anything. And so already by the 10th century, Sadia Gaon asks, what on earth makes us a nation? Because we don't have any of the normal characteristics of a nation. And he replied in these famous words, Ein umma tenu umma ela terra. The only thing that links us is our Torah. Because of the Torah, we read the same books and we read the same bits of the same book at the same time. We keep the same festivals. We say pretty much the same prayers. And it is Torah that unites us and gives us strength. Very important that we are aware of certain things that happened in the past. Spain had its Kristallnacht in 1391. It expelled its Jews in 1492. So for 101 years, Spanish Jewry was under a state of continuous persecution. They were deprived of entry into any of the professions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They were, they were, they, you know, their their the, their prosperity was gone altogether. The the, the the screws were being tightened. And in 1432, the Jewish communities of Spain came together at Valladolid, the Synod of Valladolid, and they took a series of communal decisions that there would be taxes on kosher meat, on smachot, and all sorts of other things to fund Jewish education. Fund Jewish education at an increased level so that every, uh, every community that had 15 Jewish children had to have a teacher, etc., etc. It was one of the most extraordinary provisions ever as that community was suffering impoverishment and persecution, it decided to invest in Jewish education. It was an absolutely extraordinary moment. The same was true of communities in Central Europe after the end of the Thirty Year War that devastated Central Europe. At least a third of the population died. The Thirty Years' War ended in 1648. A few years ago, um, Pinkasim, you know, communal notebooks came to light. And the first thing Jewish communities did after this devastation of Central Europe was put their education systems together. But if you want the case of all cases, you have to turn to the Gemara in Baba Basra, Davchov, Alef, Amadalev, which talks about how the Jewish community in Israel in the first century, just before the destruction of the Second Temple, established the first ever system 
of compulsory uh, universal education for children from six years old upward. I mean, the jury was falling apart. Everyone knew that something bad was going to happen. You know, the, the, the prophets of doom were everywhere. And yet, uh, Yoshua Ben Gamla established this first ever universal education system at the hardest of times. That's what I want to say to you. Jewish history tells us, invest in Jewish education in the tough times. When people are poor, when they've gone through crisis, when they've gone through trauma, that's when you invest in the future. The first thing you, we have to say to parents is, <laughs> you've been given an extraordinary opportunity to fulfill a mitzvah that is the greatest mitzvah in the, the whole Torah, you know, vishinantam levonecha, vidibaratava, in Judaism, Parents are educators, and uh, yes, we delegate this to educators, and educators become wonderful. But I, I think it's 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 um, very important to tell parents to look on this as a privilege, not not just as a burden, because their children will never forget this. They will have learned from their parents. They will have come close to their parents more than they ever would have done otherwise. And these are very special times. There may be testing times, and no one should underestimate this. But I, I think one should be able to say to people, you are doing this very, very um, holy task that we speak about in the first paragraph of the Shema and the second paragraph for that matter, but which we don't normally get the chance to do. I would say that um, teachers should find ways creative ways of encouraging interaction between parents and children to the extent that they can. And this is not the normal method of classroom learning, um, but find models of, of good interaction. Secondly, um, it's terribly important for educators to be able to tell parents how to monitor their children's progress. Because we're finding in Britain, non-Jewish children, that they're just not putting in the hours, they're not putting in the work. And it's really helpful to be able to tell parents, this is how you monitor your child's progress and know, are they keeping up or aren't they? And then thirdly, I, th I think it would be hugely helpful to use this technology to have, to make, for educators to make themselves available to parents on a question and answer basis. You know, parents have to be able to feel, I can ask the teacher, you know, am I doing this right? Is my child moving in the right direction? Was that answer that they gave a good answer or a bad one? You know, I think parents need a little help here from, from the educators. There's certain things I think that, um, people love about Judaism, regardless of the level of their commitment, to be perfectly honest with you, regardless of whether they're Jewish or not. Um, there's a wonderful man called Mustafa Suleiman, who was uh, the co-creator of Deep Mind. Deep Mind is the world's leading artificial intelligence company. So he's a, he's a Muslim atheist. <laughs> and he once said to me, could he please come to shul? <laughs> and he came to shul and it was lovely having him there. And afterwards he came back for lunch and I asked him, Mustafa, well, you know, what, what did you make of it? And he said, well, I, I loved the sense of community. I don't know whether he was meaning I loved the fact that people were talking to one another all through the davening. I'm not, that I'm not sure. But you know, number one, everyone loves the Jewish sense of community. That, that, that's take it for granted. Number two, everyone knows that Jews have a passion for education and they would love to know how do we get it and of course we've got it you know and then that, 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 that is really remarkable. That passion for education stays longer than anything else so a Jew can have come from a family that gave up Yiddishkeit three generations ago but they will still still etc etc. 
But number three, you know, you just look at the world and you see how Jews have achieved beyond anything. You know, I was doing, um, everyone knows about the Nobel Prizes. We all know about that. But I, I was doing a program for British Radio about my choice in music. And I suddenly realized, hang on, wherever I look, whether I'm looking at Gustav Mahler or uh, Arnold Schoenberg or Maurice Ravel, or I'm looking at George Gershwin or Irving Berlin or, or Jerome Kern, or I'm looking at all the guys who put together West Side Story, all five of them Jewish guys from New York, Leonard Bernstein, uh, Stephen Sondheim, Jerome Robbins, Hal Prince, uh, and, and uh, Laurent, um, or all the poet singers of our time, the late Leonard Cohen, uh, Bob Dylan, um, Paul Simon, you know, I mean, we're the tiny little people. How come, wherever you look at music, there are Jews? You know, people think Jews are uh, either win Nobel Prizes or make fortunes, but actually, wherever you look, whether it's medical research, whether it's, it's, uh, whether, whether it's actual economists, you know, we won 38% of Nobel Prize. I mean, we have to be able to say to guys, guys, you know, you have seen the results. Now we're gonna show you the engine. This is the driver of all of this. And it's so powerful that it will last for generations. Your children will have it, your grandchildren will have it. You know, we're going to let you into the engine room here. So I think all these things that have made us really, really remarkable, um, do speak to people. And I think the other thing that speaks to people, sometimes negatively, but, but um, it's, it's an incredibly positive thing, is how Jews help them each other. Whenever any Jewish community anywhere in the world is in trouble, Jews get together a response. And they do it to help other people as well. Did I tell you the story of Kosovo? I used to make a half an hour television program every year for BBC One, main, you know, mainstream television, uh, just before Rosh Hashanah. But because Jews are only half a percent of the population of Britain, it had to be a program that was intelligible to everyone. So, um, so um, in 1999, they asked me to go to Kosovo where the NATO intervention in, in Kosovo in 1999 was just coming to an end. So we went to Pristina and the streets are still full of rubble where, you know, all the fighting has been. And I talk about forgiveness, you know, if the Kosovo and Albanians and the Muslims and can forgive one another, then they have a future. If not, they'll be fighting till the end of time. And the head of the NATO forces was somebody called General Sir Michael Jackson, the other Michael Jackson, not the, not the moonwalking one. So, and he said, we owe a debt to your people. I said, I said what? He said, well, when, when a, a people has been traumatized and 300,000 Kosovan Albanians have fled to Macedonia and they come back, the sign that life has gone back to normal is that the schools open on time. He says, we owe that to your people. So when I came out of the room, I was only there for a day, so I didn't have a chance to meet the local community. But I asked, how many Jews in Pristina? And they told me 11. And somehow they were running all the schools in Pristina. So, you know, I, I kind of worked it out, you know, Hashem gave us the cell phone. So they must have got in touch with the joint and with all the educational guys in Israel. And, you know, within a couple of days, the entire Jewish people was in Pristina helping the people put their education system back together. And that is the power of Jews to mobilize, to help one another. And anyone who looks at the uncertainty of the future that faces all of us, should really realize I would rather be a part of a people 
that helps one another and is there when we need them. We use two principles. Principle one is, I never judge Jews. I leave that to a Kaddish Baruch. He's going to do it better than I would do it. So for every single Jew I meet, by a mere bistushain, yeah? As far as I'm concerned, you're a beautiful Jew. Uh, I call this the Shlomo Karbach school of, uh, of, of Jewish engagement, but that's my view. Um, I just think that people do have such different backgrounds. And some of them come from such different childhoods. So I'm not going to challenge or judge anyone. I just try and respect everyone and, 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 and look up to everyone. So that's principle one. And leave the judging to Hashem. Really and truly, he's better at it than we are. Number two, and this really is not well understood. If I take material goods, they, they come in two kinds, wealth and power. So if I have a thousand pounds and I share it with nine other people, I am left with one tenth of what I began with. I only have a hundred pounds. Likewise with power, if I have total power, but then I div did decide to share it with nine other people, I only have one tenth of the power with which I began. So material goods, the more I share, the less I have. Spiritual goods are different. If I share a certain amount of knowledge with other people, or love, or friendship, or trust, do I have less or do I have more? The truth is I have more. So with material goods, the more I share, the less I have. With spiritual goods, the more I share, the more I have. And you know who knows this inside out and upside down? Chabadniks. They go out to places with no Yiddish guy whatsoever and they share their Yiddish guy. Do they have less? The answer is no, they have more. So within a school of varied degrees of commitment, everyone has to become a Chabadnik. That is to say, everyone has to be an outreach worker to share what they have with others, and they would find that they have more spirituality, not less, more knowledge, not less. And people really don't understand this. And it's a big mistake, because the more variety you have in a school, the more opportunity you have for sharing that which you have more of than others. You know, there is a... Um, This guy in New York called Nissim Nicholas Taleb, who rather sort of pre-guessed the 2007-2008 financial crash, he wrote a book called The Black Swan. And he wrote a book subsequently called Anti-Fragility. It's an odd title. He invented the word. And why did he invent the word? He said, because people think the opposite of fragility is resilience. He said, no, it isn't. Resilience means you don't crack under the pressure. But that's only a negative. I believe in anti-fragility, that is, that you grow stronger through the pressure. So there you are, he, about 10 years ago or eight years ago, he came up with this idea. I thought to myself, well done, Nicholas Taleb, but we got there before you. <laughs> because the first statement of anti-fragility I have ever come across is in chapter one of Sefer Shemot, where it says, Kashe yanu oto ken yir The more they were afflicted, the more they flourished and spread. What all your educators have and are teaching other people to have is anti-fragility. You have come through this incredible set of pressures, the like of which we have not known in our lifetime. And you, by giving other people strength, have shown a strength of your own that is 
remarkable and extraordinary and against all odds. And the truth is, Zemayesh, this is the way the world goes. Lifting others, you yourself are lifted. And you will know to the end of your days that when the world became very dark, you gave people light. When the world was full of despair, you gave people hope. When people were afraid, you gave them courage. You were there. And even when physically it was very difficult for you to work as normal, you were incredibly creative in devising ways of continuing to be effective and continuing to help people. So the things that you have been doing these last few months, you will remember for a lifetime. And you will say, yeah, it was hard. But my goodness me, I felt that I really made a difference to people's lives. And therefore, I would say, lech b'kochach Just keep going. V'kove Hashem yachlivu koach. You throw your burdens on Hashem and he will give you the strength to continue. And you will find that you will look back on this and say, thank you, Hashem, for letting me help others when they needed that help most.